Christ. For deliverance, dominion, you pay the price. Lord, we pray that the devil will not cheat anyone out of our rights, redemptive rights, and salvation rights, and family rights, and even heaven's rights in Jesus' name. We're bought with a price, purchased with a price. Lord, we pray that this price will not be in vain on any one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you grant us understanding in your word right now. That your truth will set us free. Free from everything you have made us free about on the cross of Calvary. That Lord, our lives will testify. Jesus, spirit all. Our language will testify. Jesus, spirit all. Our singing will testify. Jesus, spirit it all. And the prophet we have in the kingdom will testify. Jesus, spirit all. And within us and around us, there will be that testimony ringing out every time. Jesus paid it all. We we'll give the glory to you for what you have done. Receive all the praise and all the glory, all the adoration, all the exaltation in Jesus' name. We we'll pray that the blessing and edification will be for the people of God. We we'll thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. It's in Exodus chapter 24 that the Lord revealed to the children of Israel about the blood of the covenant. Of course, the blood had appeared before this time. You remember if you're a student of the Bible, a Christian that studies the Bible, that from Genesis chapter 3, there was the fall. Because of the fall, condemnation came. A curse came. Judgment came, punishment came, and Adam and Eve, our forefathers, were driven out of the Garden of Eden. But at that time, to make a covering for them, a cleansing for them, and to make a kind of salvation for them, a, revive, a kind of redemption for them, the Lord slayed the animal, shed the blood for them on their behalf. And then covered them with the skin thereof. Telling us, right from that time, cleansing and covering, salvation and security, they come through the shedding of the blood of the Lamb. And then after that, remember Exodus chapter 12, that the Lord told the children of Israel that the angel of death was passing through the land that time. And in that night, in every home, in every house, from the top to the bottom, and from the highest to the lowest, the firstborn will die. Telling us, reminding us, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And that death was a kind of judgment on individuals, on families, on nations, on the whole world. And then the Lord told the children of Israel at that time, every family to take a lamb and to shed the blood. And again, what they were to do, they were to apply the blood upon the lintels on the post doors of the houses where they were. And then God said, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And then that night they did that, the angel of death passed by. And in every home, in every house, somebody died. Because the wages of sin is death. But then we find the grace of God which gives life eternal. All those people that apply the blood, they were set free. Again, reminding us, forgiveness as well as freedom come through the blood of the Lamb. And they were to sit in their houses and they were to eat the blood. They were to eat the body of the Lamb. And when they ate the body of the Lamb, it was to give them strength. Because on the one hand, we have salvation. On the other hand, we have healing health and strength and then it comes to this chapter 24 now reminding them what you should never forget that it is the blood of the covenant the blood of the covenant the covenant that sets us free the covenant that saves us, the covenant that heals us, the covenant that sanctifies us, the covenant that secures us, the covenant that gives us victory, the covenant that strengthens us, and the covenant that leads us on the way to heaven. That they were to remember, it is by the blood of the covenant. Open your Bible now with me, Exodus chapter 24. I'm reading verses 7 and 8. Exodus chapter 24, verses 7 and 8. It says, and he took the book of the covenant, and he read 
heard in the ears in the audience of the people and they said all that the lord has said will we do and be obedient there's the human divine partnership in the covenant when you make a covenant is between the almighty god and the people and then moses read all the conditions of the covenant read all the things all the terms of the covenant and the people said all that the lord has said all that the lord has said all the conditions the lord has laid down all the terms of consecration the lord has laid down all the terms of the commission the commitment the lord has laid down all that the lord has said we will do and be obedient look at verse 8 and moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people he sprinkled each on the people and said behold the blood of the covenant behold the blood of the covenant believe the blood of the covenant look at the blood of the covenant which the lord has made with you concerning all these words the blood of the covenant the blood of the covenant you read in zechariah coming to almost the end of the old testament now that's the old covenant we're looking at zechariah chapter 9 i'm reading there from verse 9 they were passing on now you need to understand the development of the covenant as you look at the old covenant for for example when you look at genesis it was to be just a lamp for one family and then you come to exodus it was to be a lamp for the whole house as you come to leviticus it's going to be the lamp now for the whole nation as you come to Isaiah it's not just for one individual it's not just for one family it's not just for one nation it's now for the whole world and then they were looking forward to not an animal anymore they were looking forward to a person a person, a person, because it says, unto us a child is born. They were looking up to a person, unto us a son is given. They were looking forward to a person. And then it says, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Everlasting Father, and is the Prince of Peace. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and the zeal of the Lord shall do this. They were looking forward to a person. And Zechariah is going to bring it out now. It's not just a person. We're looking for the Lamb crucified they were looking for the lamb that is said that is bed that died they were looking for the lamb that will be buried and they were looking for the person that will take all the sins of the world away the reason one Zechariah chapter 9 I'm reading from verse 9 rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion shout O daughter of Jerusalem behold thy king cometh unto thee Behold thy king cometh unto thee. Now they were being told now, of course, if you look at the Old Testament, the lamb that they took was a perfect lamb, was a spotless lamb. It was a, a, pre, a kind of preferred lamb. And when it comes now to telling us what that lamb actually typifies, what that lamb actually represents, is saying, it's a king, it's a king. Behold thy king cometh, he is just, he is just it's now a man it's not just age it's not an animal now all those animal sacrifices only represented the lord jesus christ the very son of god the son of david and the son of abraham he tells us he is just having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass upon a coach uh, the fowl of an ass and then he says and i will cut off the, uh, the the chariot from ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen. It's telling us that it's not only the Jews that will benefit from the sacrifice of the lamb. Then all the Gentiles and the heathen will also benefit. It says his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. You know there are people that limit the redemption. They limit the sacrifice of Jesus. They limit the salvation of Jesus. Jesus unto, unto some, uh, you know, white people, unto some Jewish people, unto a little nation. But it says, it's dominion that is his error. And the people he covers, and the people he cleanses, and the people he secures, and the people he says, they'll be from sea to sea. And then it goes on in verse 11, as for thee also, 
by the blood of the covenant. You see that? As for thee also, by the blood of the covenant, have I, forced, have I sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. We were all in that prison. We were all bound there, confined there, restricted there. But now he said, I set them free. I get them out of that pit of the prison. And I do that by the blood of the covenant. Well, then Exodus talks about the blood of the covenant. Zechariah talks about the blood of the covenant. Uh, that's the Old Testament. The Old Testament is full of evidence of the blood of the new covenant, the, the blood of the covenant. And now it comes to the New Testament. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And we're referring to the same blood of the covenant. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 20 and verse 21. What the blood does, what the covenant does, and what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary when he paid the price for our redemption. He he paid the price for salvation. He paid the price for sanctification. He paid the price for security. He paid the price for a holy life, a righteous life, a pure life, a victorious life, a, a triumphant life. He paid the price so that by the price he paid and what he purchased for us, we can live victoriously and we can live triumphantly above sin, above evil, above any of those bad habits we had before. He's telling us, look at this, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse, verse 20 it says now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus you know the New Testament is very very definite and specific because we're no more in the kindergarten now where they speak to us in parables and they speak to us in uh, you know symbols and they speak to us in all those typology that he is an animal an ark and a book and this is very clear everything was pointing to Jesus and now that Jesus has come and Jesus has died and Jesus was buried and Jesus rose again and Jesus paid the whole price we don't need to talk in parables anymore by the way do you see that in the Old Testament all those symbols were there and then when Jesus came that transitional period Matthew Mark Luke and John a lot of a lot of parables a lot of symbols by the time you come to Acts of the Apostles no more parables no more parables everything is now plain you come to the Romans everything is now clear. You come to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, no more parables. Everything is now clear. You come to the epistles, you come to Ephesians, everything is now clear. And then you come to Revelation. And then it tells us and it gives us all that we need to know of the coming of the Lord. Everything is now clear. It's no more like just a lamp. It's not just like, you know, a family will take this. Because Jesus Christ now went to the cross. He has died for us. And because he shed the blood, that blood of the everlasting covenant has now done this for us. Salvation is now available through the blood of the Lamb. Sanctification is now available through the blood of the Lamb. Our security now available through the blood of the Lamb. And then heaven is now available through the blood of the Lamb. Look at that again in chapter 13 verse 20 now. At this very time, it's done. It's not something we're just looking back then at that time. And it is not in the future that this will be. It is right now. And for you to be right now in Jesus' name. Look at this. Now the God of peace. The God of peace. The God of peace that brought again from the dead. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God is mine. I say, thank God is mine. I said, thank God is mine. Our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. There you are again. Through the blood, the blood of the covenant. Through the blood, the blood, the blood of the covenant. As he tells us in the old covenant, is the blood of the covenant. It comes to the New Testament, is the blood of the covenant. It's Jesus Christ that paid the price. And I pray that it will be written upon the tables of your heart. It will be written in your soul, in your spirit, in your mind, in your head. You will know a price has been paid for you. And because of that price that I may pray for you, that's how you escape condemnation. You escape judgment. You escape all the punishment of the sins you have ever committed. Because it says, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, it makes you perfect in every good work. 
to do his will, walking in you that which is well pleasing. It says it's through the blood of the everlasting covenant, we even are able to live a righteous life. We're able to live a holy life. We're able to live a transformed life. We're able to live a, a triumphant life. And then we're able to do that which is pleasing unto God. It says, pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, we conquer the enemy. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, we conquer sin. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, we conquer the depravity. That is the original uh, kind of powerlessness, sin potence that were brought into this world. You know, temptation comes. We couldn't overcome because in our strength, we couldn't overcome all those signs and all those evidences of depravity. But now Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. And because he died on the cross of Calvary, now we conquer that depravity. And we conquer the power of darkness. We conquer the kingdom of darkness. And we conquer the flesh. We conquer the world. We conquer the devil. We conquer the fall and all the consequences of the fall. That's why we're looking at the word that tells us conquering. We're going to conquer. I said conquering, we're going to conquer. No wonder the Bible tells us, New Testament tells us, it says, nay, in all these things now, we're more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died for us, who rose again for justification, conquering through the blood covenant. There are three things we're going to look at. Number one, salvation and hope. Salvation and hope through Christ's blood. Salvation and hope. Hope of everlasting life. Hope of eternal life. The hope that as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth, and then the blood cleanses us. The blood redeems us. And the blood sets us free. And then we live a life. A life that is free. A life that is whole. A life that pleases the Lord. We have hope of life eternal. And life that is everlasting. We have hope of living with the Lord ever and ever and ever. It will be so for us, for you and for me in Jesus' name. Salvation and hope through Christ's blood. Number two, sanctification and holiness. Sanctification and holiness through the, his cleansing blood. That blood that cleanses. That blood that purifies. That blood that washes us. That blood that transforms our lives. That blood that gives us an inner triumph, an inner victory, an inner conquering power. Sanctification and holiness through his cleansing blood. Number three, security and heaven. After we are saved, he promises to secure us. He promises to make us live in the kingdom, abide in the kingdom, abide in the world, abide with him so that we are not coming in and going out and being saved and backsliding and coming in and uh, falling again. But he gives us security. He gives us steadfastness. He gives us stability. And our faith is steadfast and solid in the Lord. And then he takes us to heaven and it is through the covenant blood security and heaven through the covenant blood he will do it i said he will do it he has done it already i pray that the lord will give you and give me and give us the faith to abide and remain stable and steadfast in the lord until the very end in jesus name security and heaven through the covenant blood number one now number one is salvation and hope Salvation and hope. For those of us who are saved, we need to remind ourselves the condition of our salvation. We need to remind ourselves so that we can have faith in that unfailing word, in the faithfulness of the Lord that has brought the salvation unto us. And for those who have just given their lives to the Lord, what a wonderful thing as you remind yourself of the very fact that this is how I got saved and this is when I got saved and this is what has given me that salvation and a hope of glory when I leave this world eventually salvation and hope through Christ's blood. It's not through your own works, through Christ's blood. It's not through the tradition of men, through Christ's blood. It's not, I give money to the beggar. It's through Christ's blood. Salvation does not come by the works of man's hand. 
Salvation does not come by the religion that people practice. Salvation comes as a result of the fact that we gave our lives to Jesus who gave himself for us. He shed his blood for us. And because he shed his blood for us, we can say, praise the Lord Jesus paid it all. And because he paid the, the price for my redemption, the price for my salvation, I believe, I believe. And that faith brings us salvation. I pray that that assurance of salvation, the Lord will register in every heart in Jesus' name. I'm looking at uh, Matthew chapter 26 and um, verse 28. Matthew chapter 26. And we're looking at verse 28. Salvation and hope. Salvation and hope. And it's through the blood of Jesus. Through Christ's blood. Matthew chapter 26. And we're looking at verse 28. For this is my blood. This is my blood. The Lord Jesus Christ was about to die about to go to the cross, about to go and pay the price. And because he was about to go and pay the price, here is what he said to the people, this is my blood of the new covenant. The word testament there, the same thing, covenant, testament, testament, covenant, the same thing is the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the new testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He said, this blood is shed for many. Many in what way? many in the world at that time many in the world in every generation many in every nation many in many nations many all over from that time until it will come again many many in every century and today as many as will believe on the lord jesus christ they will discover that the blood has been shed for many the blood has been shed for many. Many that have transgressed the word of the Lord. They have transgressed the work of the Lord. They have transgressed the will of the Lord. Now Jesus died to pay the price for everyone. And he said, this is my blood. There will never be another source of salvation. There will never be another means of salvation. There has never been and there will never be another reason for us to be saved. It is the blood of the Lamb. It is the blood of the Lamb. And that is why he said, this is my blood. It is not the blood of the martyr. It's not the blood of Stephen. It's not the blood of a religious man. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the blood of our only Savior. It is the blood of the one that died for us on the cross of Calvary. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of their sins. And the moment you place your faith and your trust and your confidence in the blood of the Lamb, all the sins will be forgiven in Jesus' name. I said, all the sins will be forgiven in Jesus' name. I told you before that the story is coming all the way from Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, look at this now. Exodus chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 12. Exodus chapter 12, we're reading from verse 12. This is where it was first made very clear, very plain to the people that it is the blood that gives the cleansing. Is the blood that gives the covering. Is the blood that gives the salvation. Is the blood that sets us free from every form of judgment and punishment because of our sins. Exodus chapter 12, reading from verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. He says, I'm the Lord. I bring judgment against sin. I bring judgment against all those gods, all those idols, whether it's of Egypt or of any other nation. And then he says in verse 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, praise the Lord. And when I see the blood, I say, praise the Lord. And when I see the blood, the Egyptians were sinners. But they didn't have any sacrifice, acceptable sacrifice. They didn't have any substitute, acceptable substitute. They didn't have anything they could show that God will overlook their sin, will pass over their sin, will forgive their sin, will cleanse their sin. But the Israelites, because they saw the way of redemption. 
and the way the Lord had described unto them. And they were to kill the lamb, and they were to apply the blood. And then the Almighty God said, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will not see the sin of the people inside there. When I see the blood, I will not see the shortcoming of the people inside there. When I see the blood, I will not see the depravity of the people inside there. When I see the blood, I will not see the judgment that shall come upon the people in that house. But when I see the blood, I pray we'll see the blood concerning you. I said they will see the blood concerning you. All that you've done in the past, you know, many times your conscience is still looking at all you did in the past. But the Lord is saying, if you have put your faith in Jesus, if you have put your confidence in Jesus, if you have put your trust in Jesus, you have looked to Calvary by faith. He died for me. He paid the price for me. He shed his blood for me. He covers me with the blood. He cleanses me with the blood. He sets me apart with the blood. He saved me by the blood. He sanctified me by the blood. The Lord is saying, when I see the blood, and then he says, when I see the blood, in that verse 13, he says, I will pass over you. I will pass over you. I will pass over you. Give heaven a great amen. And the plague shall not be upon you, and the punishment shall not be upon you, and the calamity can, shall not be upon you, and the judgment shall not be upon you to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt, that's where our salvation comes from, from the blood of the Lamb. That's where our redemption comes from, from the blood of the Lamb. That's where our forgiveness comes from, the blood of the Lamb. That is why the remission of sin comes from, the blood of the Lamb. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17, we're looking at verse 11. Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, for the Lamb life of the flesh is in the blood and i have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls i've given you the blood to make an atonement for your soul i've given you the blood the blood the blood of the lamb as an atonement for your soul and it says for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul it is the blood i need to remind you again it's not the work of your hand that makes atonement for your sin it it is not your religiosity or religion that makes atonement for your sin. It is not your own sacrifice that makes atonement for your sin. It is not what you have done. It is not what you have done that makes atonement for your sin. It is not the money you have given to poor people, needy people that makes atonement for your sin. It is not your regularity in church service that makes atonement for your sin. It is not the name of your church, the name of your denomination nation that makes atonement for your sin it is not for your what your daddy did and what your mommy did in religion he built a church for your village he built a church for your tribe it is not that that makes atonement for sin for it tastes the blood it tastes the blood and it is not just any blood the blood of any deacon harry the blood of an animal now or the blood of anybody is the blood of the love of the lord jesus the blood of jesus it tastes the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul and I pray that that will sink deep into your soul into your mind into your heart in Jesus name we're looking at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. I'm reading verse 25 and then I'll back up. I'll back up to verse 9. Romans chapter, uh, chapter 3 and we're starting with verse 25. Romans chapter 3 verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood whom God has set up. He is the one that clears our record. He is the one that justifies us. He is the one that gives us redemption. And it is through this, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. When he says the sins that are passed, that means all the sins you have committed from the time you were born, from the time you knew the two and two make four. From the time you knew your left from right. From the time you came to what we call the age of accountability. You could account for what you did. When you tell the lie, you knew it was a lie. 
When you fought, she knew it was wrong. When you deceived, you knew it was wrong. From that time until you meet the Lord Jesus Christ, all that time we're called, all that you did from the age of accountability. It says over here, all those sins that are past the blood of Jesus takes their care of them all. What are those sins? Let's look at chapter 3 from verse 9. From verse 9, watch there. Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Jews and Gentiles, Jesus died for everyone. Jesus paid the price for everyone. And Jesus shed his blood so that all the sins of the Jews and the Gentiles can be forgiven. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. There is, they are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that do it good no not one is telling us that you'll never be good enough for salvation it's only because Jesus Christ died for you. That's why you get saved. You'll never be able to come and present before the Lord. See, oh God, see how good I am. See how religious I am. And see how nice I am. And see how profitable I am. It will never do for your salvation. Look at verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used the siege. The poison of us is under their leaves, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to, to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. All the world guilty. All the world guilty. Every individual guilty. Every family guilty. Every community guilty. Every city guilty. Every nation guilty. That all the world may become guilty before the Lord. Look at verse, look at the verse 20 there. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, I'm trying my best by the deeds of the law. I'm, I'm trying to be righteous in my own in my own self-righteousness. Those are the deeds of the law. It says, There shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, but now, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have seen and come short of the glory of God. All have seen, all have seen. You have seen, you have seen, I have seen in the past. And now it's saying that all the sins we committed in the past, everything will bring judgment into our lives. Everything will bring condemnation into our lives. Everything will bring eternal, everlasting punishment upon our lives. But for Jesus... But for Jesus, but for Jesus who came on the cross and said, I'll bear their punishment. I'll bear all their guilt. I'll bear all their condemnation. And he paid the price, being justified, verse 24, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, for the remission, for the cleansing of the sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. I pray that the faith to believe in that blood will be in every heart in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen there. Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It says, for when we were yet without strength, you'll never be strong enough to save yourself. You are not strong enough to save yourself. When we were without strength, you'll never be strong enough to overcome sin by yourself. The smallest sin will throw you down. The least of all sins will make you a sinner because it says we were without strength. We didn't have the strength to overcome sin. We didn't have the ability to overcome sin. We didn't have the skill to overcome sin. All those sins in our nature, 
all those sins in our humanness, all those evil that will draw us and drive us and, and doom us in eternity, eternal punishment. We need to have the strength to overcome them. But Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, how he came, he didn't come just to make us religious. Many people don't know that. He didn't come just to make us, you know, have a Sunday worship and have all those, all these meetings that are, he came to set us free from sin. If he doesn't do that in our lives, he doesn't want to do any other thing. He wants to set us free from sin. And he says, he came. He knew how helpless we were, how hopeless we were, how impotent we were, how incapable we were. And because of that, we were without strength. Without strength. He says in that verse 6, but for when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Praise the Lord, he died for me. I said, praise the Lord, he died for me. I said, praise the Lord, he died for me. Did he die for you? I said, did he die for you? He died for you to take away your sin. And when you put your face in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in yourself. Some people, I trust myself, uh-uh, that will never do. Some people say, I know myself, uh-uh, that will never do. Some people say, I have confidence. If I want to overcome something, if I determine, your determination cannot give you salvation and victory. It is what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a right just man in verse 7 will one die yet by adventure for a good man some would even dare to die but God but God but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us while we were yet sinners Christ died for us you know you ask somebody are you saved he says not yet I will say what are you waiting for I want to turn over a new leaf I want to become better. I want to cleanse myself. When I know that I've turned over a new leaf and I become better, I will go to uh, say, Lord, I'm good enough for salvation. Now you'll never be good enough for salvation when it says, while we're yet sinners, yet sinners, yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Eternal wrath saved. We're saved from that. Everlasting punishment, we're saved from that. And I pray that this will burn into your heart in Jesus' name. For if when we were enemies, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Then verse 11, verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy and rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement, by whom we have received the atonement. That's what he did for us, and I pray that you will be a beneficiary of that thing he did on the cross of Calvary in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm reading over here, I'm reading here from uh, verse, I'm reading from verse 14. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 14, still talking about what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. The price he paid, the price he paid, so that all the sins of the past will be taken away. The price he paid, so that it will give you peace of mind. The price he paid, so that you have victory over all the sins of the price, because Jesus paid all the price there is to be paid. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14, for he is our peace, he is our peace, he is the one that made the way of peace for us. He is the means of peace with God. He is the one that has purchased is that eternal peace for us for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us the wall of partition between us and god he broke that down the wall of partition between us and righteousness, he broke that down. The wall of partition between us and accept acceptance with the Lord, he broke that down. The wall of partition between the Gentile and the Jews, he broke that down. The wall of partition between clay, clergy and lady, he broke that down. He broke down every wall of partition. And then he says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself obtain 
twain, one new man, to make, make him peace. So make him peace. It says that and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And he came and he preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were night. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Through him, through the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that paid the price for our redemption. Through him, through our Savior, through our substitute, through our sin bearer, we now have access unto the Father. In verse 19, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints, and of the household of God. I pray that benefit will be yours in Jesus' name. First Corinthians, First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6. In the blood of the land, the blood of Jesus that cleansed us and washed us and saved us and now is preserving us from all our depravity. It tells us in First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not, know ye not, know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God God. And that's what we are oh, all of us were like that, unrighteous. And in your strength, with all your religion, you couldn't get to the kingdom of God because the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, man and man doing that which is evil, woman and woman doing that which is evil. It says effeminate, it says abusers of themselves with mankind, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Then he said, and such was some of you. And such was some of you. But she are washed. Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. But she are washed. And then he says, And ye are but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And ye are sanctified. And by the Spirit of our God. That's what he has done. That's what he has done. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 12 to verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9. We're reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 9. Reading from verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats no more or car and calves no more but by his own blood. By his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. By his own blood, he entered into that holy place that is into heaven itself. And then he says, he has now obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and, of, and the ashes of an ephah sprinkling, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, how much more shall the blood of Christ, how much more shall the blood of Christ through who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living and the true God. Verse 22, verse 22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Without shedding of blood is no remission. Without the shedding of blood of Jesus, no salvation. Without the shedding of the blood of Jesus, no redemption. Without the shedding of the blood of Jesus, there's no forgiveness. Without the shedding of the blood of Jesus, there is no eternal life. For without shedding of blood is no remission. I pray that God will help us and will believe in that blood that was shed for us in Jesus' name. I told you it's salvation and hope, salvation and hope through Christ's blood. We're looking at 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, we're looking at verse 3. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope. By that blood has begotten us again unto a lively hope. By the shedding of the blood of Jesus, he has begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept 
by the power of God who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In the last time, it will be revealed for every one of us in Jesus' name. Verse 18, for as much as she know that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation and received by tradition from your fathers, but for the precious blood of Christ, redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, saved by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Look at Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2, we're reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 is talking to us, is speaking to us about our salvation, about our redemption, about the hope we have in the Lord. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. It's yours. I said it is yours. The grace of God, the favor of God, the mercy of God, the love of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, not frivolously, we should live soberly, not superficially, we should live soberly, not carelessly, we should live soberly, not worldly. It says we live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present we're looking for. That blessed hope, that's age, and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. That we might that he might redeem us from all iniquity. How many iniquities? How many iniquities? That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Tell me the next word there. Zealous of good works. I pray the Lord will accomplish it in our lives in Jesus' name. He tells us in First John chapter 3, verse 1. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Be, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. The hope of a child of God. The hope we're looking forward to that Christ is coming. And when he comes, all those who are saved... When he comes, all those who sins have been forgiven. When he comes, all those who have enjoyed that faith and empty prize that Jesus Christ paid. He says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Look at verse 3. And every man, and every man, and every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself. Purifieth himself. Not purified in the past and that's all. Not so, but now every day you avoid sin. Every day you overcome sin. Every day you are triumphant. Every day you are victorious. Every day you are living the transformed life. Everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as, tell me, even as, tell me out loud, even as he is pure. I pray that God will confirm that in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Point number two, point number two, tell me point number two. Tell me clearly so I can hear you. Salvation and holiness through his cleansing blood, his cleansing blood. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, I read from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we read from verse 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It says, by the will of God, and it's by the offering of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are sanctified. And it says, it is through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Christ. Look at verse 14. It says, for by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. He is the one that does it. There are some people that say Jesus saved them, but they sanctify. 
themselves. You see that? They said the first walk of grace, that was by Jesus. But the second walk of grace, that's them. That's them. They say by struggling, by trying, by determining, by effort, whatever, they are trying to be sanctified. It says no. It's by the will of God and it's by the offering of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ that we are sanctified. And when he does it, he will do it perfectly for you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 29 of how much sorrow punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden on the foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. He was sanctified by the blood of the covenant. And if anybody goes back now to trample on that blood and to tread on that Christ, the sanctifier, he says what a punishment is going to have because it comes the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy sin. And he has done despite to the spirit of grace. Chapter 2 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than, than, than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and with honor, and he, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for many people. Every man, he tasted death for every man. He wants everybody to be saved. That's why he paid the price for everyone's redemption, everyone's salvation. Every man, he tasted death for every man. In verse 10, he says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. In bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That is, through the suffering of Jesus on the cross. That's how he's going to bring you to glory. Verse 11, for he, both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified. Is he who sanctifies? Is he who sanctifies? Jesus, only Jesus ever is our savior, is our sanctifier, is our healer, is the baptizer, and he is the coming king. It's not, you know, I'm trying to sanctify myself. I'm trying to cleanse myself. I'm trying by struggling. No, both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. And then it says, for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people. Jesus also that he might sanctify the people. Again, he's telling us if he is our savior, then he's going to be a sanctifier. He's the one that does both. He heals, he delivers, he sets free and he strengthens, he empowers. He's the one that does it all. He says, wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate let us go forth therefore unto him let us go forth therefore not unto saint peter let us go therefore unto him not unto mary let us go forth therefore unto him and it's not on the founder of your church it says let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp outside the camp bearing his reproach for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We have no continuing city here. The city we live in here, the Lord is saying, is not everlasting. It is not eternal. We seek another one to come, which will be eternal. Verse 20, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, was that great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect, that sanctification make you perfect in every good work to do his will, walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Him. That's what it does. It's the blood of Jesus that sanctifies and cleanses us from all sin. First John chapter 1. First John chapter 1 verse 5. This then is the message that which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 
If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we say I am saved and was still in a dark kind of covenant with sick society, it say we lie and do not the truth. If we if we say we we, we are in the light if we say we we'll walk in the light and then we use the cover of the night to do all those nocturnal things all those night things all those night evils that they do in their pop house that they do in all those uh, things they do in that dim light and the foolishness of sin that they practice there it says we we'll lie and do you know the truth it says when we come to christ we'll walk in the light we'll live in that we'll behave in the light our lives are clean our lives are clear and everything we do is brought into the open and we live transparent lives we live transformed lives and we live holy lives that's why it says the people that are saying hey, i'm born again i'm sanctified and then saved and sanctified they're still doing some things behind the curtain that should not see the light of day if we say if we say it's only what they say in religion what not what they do they can't do it they can't do it because the reality of the salvation sanctification is not in them but if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth but if we walk in the light praise the lord we can walk in the light i said praise the lord you will walk in the light when you walk in the light, there is no shame. When you walk in the light, there is no condemnation. When you walk in the light, there is no guilt. When you walk in the light, there is no judgment. When you walk in the light, your, your heart is free. Your mind is free. Everything is in the light. That's why it says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, what does it do? Tell me out loud, what does he do? Cleanses us from all sin. It will happen in every life in Jesus' name. The cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. The cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. It cleanses us within and cleanses us without. It cleanses us in the day and cleanses us in the night. It cleanses us when we're alone. It cleanses us when we're with people. There is a cleanliness, there's a cleansing, there's a holiness, there's a righteousness that is coming through and through in your soul, in your mind, in your spirit, in your heart, in your life, everywhere. And I pray that that cleanse will be real in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. It tells us in the Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. He gave himself for the church that he might sanctify. You see that it always, always is telling us it's Christ that sanctifies, it's Christ that purifies, it's Christ that cleanses, it's Christ that purges us. It tells us that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. A glorious church will be a glorious church. I said, will be a glorious church. What makes a church a glorious church? Salvation, cleansing righteousness holiness this, this kind of consanctification uh, purifies us when the members are purified and the ministers are purified and the workers are purified and everyone in, and then as the people are coming in they see the beautiful life of righteousness and holiness and then our lives are bringing conviction unto the people that are coming in and they fall on their faces before the altar oh lord i see myself dirty because i see these people that have walked on do the same thing for me and they get sanctified and they get saved and sanctified and then the church every time is saving them daily as many that are coming to the lord that's what makes us a glorious church it's not just a bunch of religious people a bunch of uh, you know church coming people that whose lives are never different from the people of the world that the things they do in the world they do each in the church that doesn't make us a glorious church but this will be a glorious church I said, this will be a glorious church. Your experience will be glorious, man will be glorious, and then all of us together, saved and sanctified and cleansed and purged and purified, and then we're on our way to heaven. It will be a glorious church in Jesus' name, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It will be holy and without blemish. That's who we will be in Jesus' name. 
Paul's first Thessalonians chapter, first Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain. Abstain. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And then you say, the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Do you see all these references we're reading? Yes, we have a part to play. We consecrate. Yes, we have a part to play. We lay everything on the altar. Yes, we have a part to play. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. All that we do. But then he, when we have surrendered, when we have consecrated, he is the one that eventually, finally, fully triumphantly sanctifies us and the very God of peace sanctify you holy and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ verse 24 everybody reading this verse 24 verse 24 everybody one two three go say that again Instead of saying, you say me. Let me hear you about yourself. Say it to the Lord now with confidence. Faithfully see that call it me who also will do it. The power that sanctifies is greater than the power in the world that tried to put your nose, your face on the mold. The power that sanctifies and the person that sanctifies the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than the one outside there that is trying to tempt you and trying to make you not to have this glorious experience of heaven because it says faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I read here from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. Wherefore see we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight, lay aside every weight, lay aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset us. Look at your life after you were saved. The things that so easily beset you, that will so easily tempt you, that will so easily put your back to the ground, that will so easily make you fall. Let us lay aside the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, that's our Savior, looking unto Jesus, that's our sanctifier, looking unto Jesus, that's our security, looking unto Jesus, that's the one that strengthens us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for conceit that him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. Ye have not yet resisted sin unto ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Verse 14. Follow peace with all men, follow peace with all men, and tell me the rest. Follow peace with all men, tell me the rest. Follow peace with all men, tell me the rest. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. We will see the Lord. I said we will see the Lord when he sanctifies us and purifies us through the blood of the everlasting covenant and by his grace day after day and week after week and moment after moment he helps us and strengthens us to live that righteous holy sanctified life we will see him on that final day in jesus name Point number three, security and heaven through the covenant blood. Security and heaven through the covenant blood. Already we have read in Exodus chapter 12. We're going to read that again. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. A security is because we stay under the blood of the Lamb. Abide under the blood of the A security. Security. Security and heaven. Security and heaven. 
through the covenant blood. We're looking at Exodus chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 7. Exodus chapter 12, reading now from verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. It says, we'll take, they take the blood and they put upon the side posts or upon the lintels of the houses where they were. And then it tells us in verse 22, verse 22, it says, And ye shall take a bunch of his soap and dip it in the blood that is in the, and that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. None of you shall go out of the house. That's the security. We abide in him. We stay in him. And we remain, we dwell in him. And it is that abiding, that dwelling that gives us that security. Verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel and upon the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer, will not permit the destroyer to come in unto you, unto your houses to smite you. I pray that we remain abiding all the, all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. We're back to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 35. Abide, 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 abide in him. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done, the will of God, ye might receive the promise, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Jesus is coming again. I said, Jesus is coming again. And when he comes, he wants to find you within the house, within that salvation. And he says in verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, if any man draw back, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But thank God we are not of them who draw back unto what? Those who draw back, what do they draw back to? Those who backslide, what do they backslide into? Perdition. We are not of them that draw back. I am not of them that draw back drawing back to perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Continue, continue. Jesus says continue. I will continue in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 13. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, the great promises of the new covenant. He says, but having seen them afar off, they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. What does that mean? Look at the children of Israel. They came out of Egypt. And every time there's a little challenge, a little difficulty, they say, is it not better to go back to Egypt? Every time they didn't have enough food to eat, is it not better to go back to Egypt? We remember the onions and the concombers we used to drink, to, to eat. Every time they had a little challenge, a little kind of brush with uh, Moses, their leader, is it not better to choose a captain and go back to Egypt? Look at that verse 15 again for truly. If they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now, but now, 
about these people, steadfast people, committed people, consecrated people, these people, the people that set their mind and their face towards seven. It says, but now they declare they desire a better country that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to call them, to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. I will be there. I said, I will be there. We will not backslide in Jesus' name. And that's why he's telling us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, make up your mind, make up your mind that now you are saved and then you are sanctified and you are secured in Christ. Never even think about Egypt anymore. Every time you have temptation, you have trial, you have any pressure, never think about Egypt anymore. Is it not better to go back? Is a, is a, is a suicide, spiritual suicide, everlasting suicide to ever think of going back to Egypt? I will never go back to Egypt. I said I will never go back to Egypt. That means you'll never go back to the world, all the vomits you have vomited, all the things you have left before. You are not going to go back into them in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm reading verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? And then you say, but one receiveth the prize, so run that she may obtain. So run that you may obtain. Un understand, you are running for a prize. You are running for a goal. You are running for a destination. You have something on your mind. You want to get to that heaven at last. And every morning you wake up, you say, praise the Lord, I'm saved. And praise the Lord, I'm sanctified. And I need to remain secured in the Lord. And therefore, every day you are running that race and then you are facing that heaven. So run that she may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things you are controlled in everything what you eat and what you drink and what you wear and where you go and the friendship you you maintain everything you, you are thinking about in terms of heaven every work you do every conversation you have every relationship you maintain you're looking at that in as it relates to getting to heaven that is why that he says you, you are temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown but we are incorruptible i therefore so run not as beating the air so fight i not as one that beaten the air and i'm not running on certain but i keep my body under you keep Keep your mouth under you keep your eyes under you keep your emotion under you keep your feeling under you keep your desires under it says I keep my body under and then it says I bring it to subjection lest that by any means after when I have preached to others I myself should be a cast away you'll not be a cast away in Jesus name it tells us in Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32, and I'm reading from verse 38. Jeremiah chapter 32, we're looking at it from verse 38. We have come to enjoy the benefit of the everlasting covenant. We're saved. We have come to enjoy the benefits of the everlasting covenant. We are sanctified. We have come to enjoy the benefits of this everlasting covenant. And we are secured, saved, sanctified, and secured. And he tells us in chapter 32 of Jeremiah, reading from verse 38, he tells us, And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Give me a good amen there. And I will, and I will give them, verse 39, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever i will give them one heart that's sanctification that's purification of their heart i will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them and i will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me, that they shall not depart from me, that they shall not depart from me. We will not forsake the Lord in Jesus' name. And that's a security. That's a security. When you make up your mind, come what me. When you make up your mind, whatever trial you make up your mind, whatever temptation you make up your mind, whatever pressure you make up your mind whatever problem you are not going to depart from the Lord you'll be secure until that day in Jesus name in Romans
Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 31. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. It tells us in verse 31, it says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to to the charge of God's elect. It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Then he says, so is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The apostle is asking us a question. And I direct the question to you. Think about it in your life. Think about it. All the people in your life who is strong enough that you love more than Jesus. Who is strong enough that to take your love and to take your devotion, to take your commitment away from the Lord. And you say, Mr. So-and-so, Madam So-and-so, Brother So-and-so, Sister So-and-so, Mommy so and so daddy so and so who is it who shall separate us from the love of Christ there are some people they are not looking at Christ Christ and Christ alone they are not looking at Jesus only our message Jesus only our savior Jesus our sanctifier Jesus our healer Jesus our baptizer in the Holy Ghost and Jesus the one we are waiting for they are not looking at Jesus and Jesus only they are looking at so and so they are looking at such and such and because of that they cannot be steadfast they cannot be stable they say if so and so encourages me i will go on in the lord if so and so abides with us i will say, say with the lord if so and so keeps on coming to the church i will remain with the lord but he was my overseer he was my this and that if he leaves i'm leaving if he wants to go to hell i want to go to hell with him too i will not go to hell with anybody i said i will not go to hell with anybody Anybody who wants to go to hell, that's his choice. But I am going to get to heaven. You will get to heaven in Jesus' name. That's why it says, who is who, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written? For thy sake are we killed all the day long. And we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. This is personal now. For I am persuaded. Where are you? For I am persuaded. I said, where are you? For I am persuaded. Where are you? For I am persuaded. Look at this. It says that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature nor any other creature whether here or there any other creature at home or in the village any other creature inside the church or outside the church i am persuaded that no other creature shall be able to separate me separate us from the love of god which is in christ jesus our lord that's how to remain steadfast in the lord and that's how to remain that by the grace of god all the things the wind blowing in the world will not sweep you away in Jesus name you'll overcome and that heaven will be yours at last in Jesus name Revelation chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 7 Revelation chapter 2 we're looking at verse 7 it says he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches and it says to him that overcometh I will overcome I said, I will overcome. To him that overcometh will I give to each of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him that overcometh, I will give to each of that tree, which is in the midst of the paradise. It tells us in chapter 3, verse 21, chapter 3, verse 21, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I'm set down with my my father on the throne he 
said, if you overcame like he over, like he overcame, if you overcome like he overcame, that you're going to sit down with him on the throne. How do you overcome? How do you overcome? It's by the blood of the Lamb. Remember that the everlasting covenant and the everlasting blood of the everlasting covenant. We're looking at Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus had died. Jesus had paid the price. And Jesus shed his blood for you. And he says, if you keep on looking unto Jesus, you are saved. You keep on looking unto Jesus, you are sanctified. You keep on looking unto Jesus, you are secured. Then on that final day, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive will be raised together, caught up together with them. That day when the saints go marching in, you'll be there in Jesus' name. And then remember, you follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. But I will see the Lord. I said, I will see the Lord. I said, I will see the Lord. You want to rise up now and make a commitment to the Lord. I will see the Lord. I will see the Lord. I will see the Lord. Make sure you are saved. Make sure you are saved. And make sure you are sanctified. And make sure you are secured in Christ. You are secured in Christ. You want to tell the Lord, oh Lord, here I am. Here I am. I will not look back. I will not go back. Have you given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? And make up your mind. Nothing will separate me from Christ. Nobody will separate me from Christ. A friend and enemy will not separate me from Christ. Christ, a mother, a father will not separate me from Christ and then a child, a son, a daughter will not separate me from Christ a member, a minister will not separate me from Christ, a pastor, an overseer will not separate me from Christ nobody, but nobody will separate me from Christ, open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord thank you for the salvation, Jesus paid it all, Jesus paid it all and because of the price he paid, because of the death he died, that that's why we're saved. That's how we're saved. You want to talk to the Lord in prayer. You want to say, oh Lord, here am I, here am I, here am I. Do this in me. Do this in me. Do this in me. And let the salvation be real. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For the seed of God abides and remains in him. And he cannot sin. And he cannot sin. And he will not sin because he's born of God. By this we know who the children of God are. Whoever does not do righteousness is not a child of God. Is the child of the devil. He that is born of God who is a real child of God. Day by day and moment by moment. Temptation will come. Trial will come. But he is an overcomer. By the blood of the Lamb. By the grace of God. In the mercy of the Lord. By the compassion of the Lord. He is overcoming every time. You tell the Lord I'm going to be an overcomer. I'm going to be an overcomer. He that overcometh, he that overcometh, he that overcometh. I will grant him to eat with me on my table in paradise. I will make him to sit with me on that seat of glory on the throne because he overcame just like I have overcome. The Lord is telling you to make up your mind. Who will separate you from Christ? Who do you love so much that will separate you from Christ? What do you love so much? The things of the world, the things that glitter that aren't gold, that will separate you from Christ. What is it you love? You are running after maybe certificate, you are running after success, you are running after this. What is strong enough to remove you, to remove your faith and your focus away from Christ? You want to tell the Lord nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing from hell, nothing on earth, nothing from the sky will separate me from the Lord. I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm secured in Christ. I'm going to remain saved and sanctified and secured in Christ. Nothing will separate me from Christ. You tell the Lord, tell the Lord, make up your mind. The time will come, temptation will come. The time will come, trial will come. The time will come, difficulties will come. The time will come, pressures will come. The time will come that all those things the storm of life may come but you have made up your mind neither death nor life nor height nor valley nor creature any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of Christ who died for me and gave himself for me nothing will separate me from Christ make sure you are saved first that's the foundation of all experiences make sure you are born again that's the foundation of all experiences and then after you are saved cleansed by the blood of the Lamb washed in the blood of the lamb and then you tell the lord i need to be sanctified i need to be sanctified my heart sanctified my spirit sanctified my soul sanctified my mind sacrificed my life my life sanctified because 
the God of peace. The God of peace shall sanctify you holy. Body, soul, and spirit. Spirit, soul, and body. And he'll preserve you blameless and holy and godly and righteous until the coming day of the Lord. And faithful is he who has called you who also will do it. And you remember that Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. He went to the cross of Calvary so that he might sanctify us with that will, with that offering that he offered, that he might sanctify us and then let us go forth unto him beyond the gate without the gate outside the gate bearing its reproach bearing its reproach bearing its reproach they'll make fun of you bearing its reproach they will ridicule you bearing its reproach they will kind of degrade you humiliate you bearing its reproach and holding on to this experience the lord has given unto you that you are not going to allow the injury of the world or the blame of the world or whatever it is the world destroying at you you're not going to allow that to make you to go back because we're not of them that turn back and go back unto perdition we are them that forge ahead and move ahead unto that eternal salvation eternal crown of glory that has preserved for us you tell the lord i will not go back i will not turn back i will not turn back i will not die in the middle of the way i'm going to go on until the very end make up your mind and lay everything on the altar come to consecrate and come to surrender everything and come to yield everything unto the Lord and say Lord here am I, here am I, here am I, O oh Lord saved and sanctified and secured in the Lord. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord he is able, he is able, he is able, able to keep them to the uttermost, the people that come unto God by him. You tell the Lord, you tell the Lord, you tell the Lord I am going to remain to the very end. I'm going to remain, I'm going to remain, I'm going to remain unto the very end. You need the grace of God in all the grace you can get in the time of prayer. You need all the strength you can have in the time of prayer. And you need to focus on Christ looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You're not, you're not loving success above Jesus. You're not loving victory above Jesus. You're not loving prosperity above Jesus. You're not loving family above Jesus. You're not loving anyone above Jesus with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You love the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, this is my treasure. This is my savior. This is my Lord. And this is the one who died for me. He loved me. He gave himself for me. And I give myself for him. I give myself unto him. And I'm going, not going to allow. I'm not going to allow anything to divert me away from this way of the cross that leads home. The way of the cross that leads home. The way of the cross that leads home. It is good as I on what go to know that the way of the cross leads home. Let that cross do something your heart today. That's where Jesus died. That's why he shed his blood for you. That is where he gave everything for you. And he's saying that you take up your cross now. You follow after me. It's the way of the cross that leads home. It's the way of the cross that leads home. That means you forsake the way of the world and you walk in it never more. You walk in it never more. For my Lord says come and I hear you say and then I say, I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow that way of the cross and nothing, 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 nothing on earth and nothing under the earth and nothing in the sky will be able to separate me from that love of Christ. Saved, sanctified, and secured. Saved, sanctified, and secured. Saved, sanctified, and secured. Saved and sanctified and secured you'll walk on and move on until the very end with the lord jesus christ